Hey guys, so today in this video I specifically want to talk about art. Now I don't really often talk about art, or I don't really mention it, I don't go over the dynamics of the meaning of art, you know, the aesthetics of art, the philosophy of aesthetics or any of these things, but I was recently looking into some artwork done by a Mexican from the 20s, in which illustrated to me some very interesting, um, influential ideas regarding the present day modern man in the 21st century, um, elitism, autocracy, transhumanism. A lot of these ideas were bobbling about in my brain when I was looking at this artwork and I originally came across it when I was looking at I think her name is Alison McDowell's uh, YouTube channel, who I recently shared the, like, it was a very long five-hour video of maybe, I think it was about a, a combination of three different lecture videos that she did on, you know, things like uh, blockchain, uh, whether blockchain is liberation or kind of a lockstep movement of tyranny and all these types of things and talking about the human 2.0 kind of project and digital twinning and all of this type of stuff and I shared her, her five hour video which was very long of course and uh, well, a lot of you enjoyed it and I looked at an, another video that she did and I came across this artist who presented a lot of these interesting ideas for me that I've wanted to even delve into myself and kind of maybe explain my kind of vision in which I see from these pieces, which I think are very profound, to be honest, because there's this Promethean painting in which he did, and all this other stuff, in which to me represents something very artistic, something very creative, but also something very prominent in our culture today, at least in this transitioning period, which we are in, which seems to be something of the modern world into the transhumanistic world, something that involves the emergence of this metaverse in which Zuckerberg and his yes-men seem to be pushing, but also something in which a lot of people would actually enjoy, sadly. So I want to kind of go over this. I want to go over the dynamics of Prometheus as a figure, in relation to this artwork, into, into this artist's pieces, and kind of illustrate a narrative or a kind of mythology of what I see from the creations of these very illustrative and imaginative uh, artworks and frescoes, in which most of them are. They most most of them are frescoes. Now, the artist is called, if I can remember, Jose Clemente Orozoco. So, Jose Clemente Orozoco. He's Mexican. Um, and he did many different pieces, which were, I think, coincided with the Mexican Revolution, which I think happened around the time in which he was producing these. But I don't really just want to specifically go into his back history or anything like that, but I just want to talk about the art pieces themselves. So, one of his pieces is called Prometheus, and I think it's very striking, it's very William Blake-ish, or William Blake-ish. It's, it's got this kind of style that you'd see in William Blake's pieces, and I do like, what I find most interesting about it is the dynamics, but also kind of the philosophy of Prometheus, because Prometheus has always interested me. It's, it's always been this interesting character in mythology, uh, Helianistic mythology, Greek mythology, that I've always been kind of fascinated by. And the reason for this is primarily because of the... something I've always questioned, of something I've always pondered on, I guess, is the difference between Lucifer and Prometheus. And sometimes you see in history or at least in some of the occult groups, maybe even in the Theosophical Society or some other occult organizations, you see kind of the, um, the kind of emergence or the uh, symbiosis of both these 
characters in which Prometheus is Lucifer, or Lucifer is Prometheus, but Prometheus to me has always had this characteristic of being something a little bit different. It is the ethics and morality of Prometheus have always been different from Lucifer or the Antichrist or of uh, Satan, if you will, because Prometheus is a figure in which sacrifices himself for humanity. Now, this is completely different from anything like Satan, Lucifer. Lucifer, I, I see as being a very egoistic uh, depiction or archetype, if you will. Something that is maybe very narcissistic, very self-interested, in a sense, in which doesn't no element of Lucifer or of the Antichrist that sacrifices himself for humanity. So I do often do see Prometheus as having these elements or these kind of fragrances, you could say, of um, Christ, or not not of the Antichrist, but of Christ, because Christ sacrifices himself, or gives himself up for the sins of the world. But the, the twist in it is, of course, the story Prometheus being this god, this titan, who steals from the gods, steals from the higher heavens of, you know, the, of the of the cosmos, or of the cosmology, and he steals fire, and fire is obviously the most symbolic symbol of all imagery, I mean, fire is the thing, you could say, is no different from the Tao, you know, it's no different from maybe even the symbol of Abraxas, because the dynamics of fire is, is the embodiment of opposites, all in one, it's creation and destruction, you know, fire can create or be the thing in which in which, in which gives potential for anything, but also can be the thing in which gives potential for complete destruction. So, fire is this unbelievably potent image, right? And fire could you could very much say is the blueprint of all creation or blueprint of creation itself. It is the blueprint of creation, and it is stolen from the heavens, and it is given to humanity. So what does this illustrate? It illustrate, you know, you can ask the question, what does Prometheus illustrate in this sense? That Prometheus is this being, this god, who gets hold of the blueprint of, of existence, and gives it to humanity. And now this is very interesting, because it's like, well, if, if this is the blueprint of existence then this must be, you know, the thing which transcends or is, is the ability itself to be, or at least emanate, or not even emanate, but a kind of, you know, pretend to be God. You know, if someone has this element and someone has this, this force, this, this ultimate uh, libidinal power of will, which is fire, which you could say is the divine force, which has been stolen from the gods, it is, as, it is as if someone has gotten the gotten the potential to do whatever one wishes to humanity, or at least give that possibility to humanity itself and see what humanity can do with it. And this is what Prometheus does, of course, he gives the fire to humanity. And in this fresco that you see by uh, a Rosco, you see this kind of dynamic, you see people in the crowd being all for it, like cheering on, like, yes, bring this flame down, open up the heavens, bring it down, you know, and then you've got some other people who are kind of being, you know, quite frightened of it, quite frightened of the situation of, like, being fearful of the entrance of this force, of the entrance of this this very destructive and yet also very creative force, this transformative substance, a bit like um, alchemy. You know, this at the same time, this force can bring about negredo, which is a uh, black, the substance of black, but also bring about gold, which I uh, think is algredo, I'm not sure. But it is the transformative substance. It is the, it is the divine source, you could say which can transform a complete um, civilization, 
a complete humanity. And you could say this itself, in reality, in relation to this to this image of Prometheus, Prometheus in a, is in a sense right now, we could say, which is humanity itself, bringing down the, the cultural changes in which we are seeing today, which is transhumanism. He's bringing this force into being and offering it to humanity and saying, look, we are going to change the world. We're going to create a new world order, transhumanistic world order in which transforms humanity forever. And some people, like in this fresco, are afraid of it. Some people are all for it. Some people are cheering it on. Some people are like, no, this is the biggest thing that could destroy everything that's been, that ever has been beautiful, that we've ever understood or known. So it's like, this very interesting dynamic that you see here, and this is why it's so interesting in relation to transhumanism, because the fire is this transhumanistic essence, if you will. It has this essence that what we have attained is possibly a possible ability to transcend the human body um, into a, another realm, at least, into a digital realm, into a realm which is separate from the body. This is obviously a Gnostic. Um, this has a sense of Gnosticism. It isn't Gnosticism, but it has a sense of it. It isn't it precisely, but it does have a sense of Gnosticism and of a transcendence of material matter. And that what is being brought to us is the... Through transhumanism is uh, a possible... Um, you could say, not answer, but transformative method of where consciousness exists. You know, people have always questioned, like, Descartes, the Cartesian situation, whatever it is in philosophy, you have the, oh, is, is consciousness in the brain, or is it in the body, or is it is it in the mind, or, you know, all these things. But transhumanism offers a kind of difference, not even a solution, but just a progression where <laughs> it's, it's crazy really, but it offers a progression of consciousness being somewhere else. We can put consciousness into something else. You know, we can put it into the metaverse, we can put it into into algorithms, we can put it into databases. We can reduce consciousness or our understanding of consciousness into data and then we can make it programmable and then we can maybe even put human consciousness into computers. You know, it's, who knows, it's possible. We really don't know at this point with the development of technology. Maybe we could actually put consciousness into computers, but maybe that is what we are doing. We are, isn't that, is that not what we are doing to some extent? Obviously there's an input and then there's an output. The input isn't coming from the computer, it's coming from us as conscious beings. And then the output is on maybe our use of the internet and then producing a video, for example, like this thing here. But what transhumanism offers is a frightening vision that, that, that uh, offers a, different, a progression of the question of consciousness. And that is kind of what has always been the ultimate question, the hard question of consciousness. Something scientists can never figure out. But obviously in this Promethean kind of voyage, you could say, that Prometheus is bringing down this, this flame, this fire, which is the hard question of consciousness, maybe. And that itself is being brought, brought down to us and people are screaming or they're laughing or they're enjoying it because really it's just a battle of the interests. People want this in a certain way, people don't want this in a certain way. People love Elon Musk for some reason, some people don't love Elon Musk. You know, people are in this division as all civilizations are always in. So the same division obviously conquers and is at the most heightened state when such a revolution in humanity 
or in the developments of, huma of humanity occur, such as what could be illustrated through this Promethean illustration or this Promethean um, fresco by Jose Clement. We can't say his name, his Mexican name, but Orizoco. Orizoco. Okay, this is what is presented through this. This painting, at least from what I can see now, if we apply it to, uh, to today, it's very interesting. So another painting he did, which I find very interesting, is I think called Le Conquesta, uh, The Conquest, I think, in Mexican. So, as you can see, this is very interesting. So, this is kind of like, to me, the image of the development of transhumanism. You know, we're going past at this point, beyond... Maybe this is kind of an antique way of looking, or maybe a too... Spa too much of a space space fiction futuristic look at transhumanism maybe but um you know this is, this is beyond the the reality of digital twinning and and the metaverse but instead someone's actually embodied themselves inside this kind of metal framework and anatomy and they've kind of gotten rid of the human body and what i find most interesting about this is to apply a kind of carl jungian psychoanalytic application to this because you see with the woman here, this angelic woman is above the robot, which is this new form of man, right? And this angelic robot, well, it's, it's an angelic female, right? It's an angelic woman, you could call it the muse, which is guiding this man, the other half of man, or what you would call the, the anima in the Jungian sense, which is the feminine. And what you have is... What I see in this is kind of like a, maybe an unconscious representation of this anima reality. And that man has fallen into this transhumanistic state. And you have her, which is maybe the digital anima. And, he, and she, in a sense, is guiding him because her head is staring into his soul. You know, it's, it's demanding actions from him. As if she is in control of him. She's, in a sense, in this drawing, a part of him. Her hand is coming down to his hand. She is in some sort of peculiar way connected to his construction as well. And she's obviously in flight. She's upside down. She's angelic. And with that angelic sense of existence, you could kind of relate it to the ether. You know, she is flying. She's in the air. She's angelic. She's eth etheric. She lives in the ether. And what, what you have in relation to that idea of ether is the ethernet, the internet, the network, the web, the World Wide Web. It exists in the air. You know, how do you send things to people in this internet age of things? Is you send it through signals in the air. And as many people have said, like meme analysis, uh, meme analysis, who originally uh, coined the idea of the digital anima, he obviously illustrates this idea of a devouring mother, and that is what the digital anima is, and that what that is what the internet has been, in many different ways, to devour the libido, the energy force, into an existence of its own replication of reality. And that's obviously what we have with the internet, in this sense. But in this illustration, in this fresco, we get it to such an extreme point that the digital anima being this angelic being that we're seeing here is controlling this transhumanistic man image to the point so far that he destroys humanity in this illustration. To the point where he destroys and kills the rest of the human experience, which is this fleshly body here, you know, the body of flesh. You know, that, that, that in symbolism, in relation to a transhumanistic kind of change in reality, is most depictive of what the human existence is, that we are just these... Not just these, but we are human existence itself. We are vulnerable to the transhumanistic movement. 
that is so brutal and robotic and determined and inhuman and alien from ourselves. And that's what we see here, and in obviously the landscape is complete destruction, complete, complete a complete uh, destruction of human um, environment or human civilization. That it has become instead a rocky existence of hard surfaces and um, destruction. No element of human beauty or any understanding of human beauty. And obviously we see with the, the armor, or you could say the, the, the structure of these two kind of a alienated beings that they're both existent of hard surfaces. You know, they're not, they're not human anymore. And you could say, well, this is the crusade of the transhuman movement. Of course, obviously I'm reading into this. As in, I'm making a intuitive response to our modern times that we're moving into now and applying it to this artwork. You know, I saw this artwork and I thought, for me personally, I just looked at it and I was like, this is too, this is too aligned with what's going on now, at least, even if it's in a dramatic form, to not look into it in a certain way. And that's what I see with this. And you could kind of see, yeah, you could see this as the crusade, or the crusading of the kind of AI transhumanistic empire, you know, getting, ri uh, getting rid of the human condition. But what is most interesting is this strange angelic being, which is quite weird in the art itself, but it does keep that narrative, that archetypal narrative and depiction that exists in in reality, in this art, that there is this feminine muse that that is whispering into this man, man's ear, or at least guiding him in some sense, or at least she is trying to get his attention, or if not already got his attention and guiding him to what he should do, because at the end of the day, the internet is this, and of course the ethernet, the World Wide Web is, and the AI and all of it is of a feminine archetype. And always has been because it's devouring it's a replacement for comfort it is the thing which um is it is the panopticon in a sense it's, it's the all-seeing eye it's the pen panopticon if i'm saying all right the panopticon prison which is the all-seeing eye which sees all beings in their cells and demands them forth into a specific direction just like this being here so that's what I see in this piece. It has that union, with a union and you can see it and pick it out and kind of see the kind of archetypal descriptors within the art piece. And I think it's very powerful and I've never seen this since like a week ago. So that's what I see in that. Now this is another one, which I think is again, very interesting. And I can't remember the name of it, I'll put it up in the title. Um, I think it's something along the lines of leaders of the modern world or something like this but again it, you have this kind of hierarchy illustrated in this fresco but what i want to pay attention most to is the the finitude of existence which is represented by the skeleton structure you've kind of got this expression of finite existence you know the you could say maybe the, if, if you were looking at it from a transhumanistic perspective that the finite existence of a mortal life is kind of transcended in a sense because what you then start to see is like these kind of little glass tubes of children of skeleton children that this weird kind of skeletal black you know entity which represents kind of like death i guess is pulling out from this kind of finite human who only exists for so long because immortal of course but what he's doing is kind of like compressing these these essences or these kind of energies of humanity into these glass tubes right to then you know kind of be like well i'm gonna you know look after them i'm gonna what could you say i'm gonna preserve them for 
the future transhumanistic uh, existence, you know, so that we do have a, a kind of a baseline blueprint for what we want, or, you know, humanity is a precious thing in itself, so we need to preserve it. And that's what I kind of see from it. And then you've got these leaders in the background. In a sense, they are kind of like leaders, but they're kind of maybe religious leaders. And they all have these kind of death masks on, or deathly looking makeup masks, a bit like the the Mexican celebration of, uh, I think it's Day of the Dead, I think, which is in November, I think it was a couple of days ago, actually, and they kind of represent this, and it's this immortal image, you know, they're beyond existence and they're beyond death, that's why they're wearing it, but they're still living and they're standing and they're, you know, representing themselves as these, as these beings above the, you know, the, the rotting, human entity which is this thing that is laid out in which this skeletal figure is kind of attaining life from it's very weird it's very interesting i don't know the actual description of what this art is supposed to represent from the artist but this is what i'm reading into it and it kind of illustrates itself there the kind of the transhuman agenda you could say especially with these figures that are very hierarchical in the background they're kind of like the the elitists the autocracy the the, the people in the suits they're the people with authority right and they're kind of pushing a movement and an agenda and you have this weird looking skeleton kind of receiving what could ever possibly be left from from the human experience which is just laying there and is just empty in a sense. As if, you know, the, the death of the human experience has come and like the re the reborn empire is to to begin. It, or in a sense. That's kind of the kind of general depiction I, I get from this. Because even in the background <clears throat> you get in the background these 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 colours of red and orange. And it's like flames, it's like a burning of a previous existence, the landscape is burnt, you know, it's gone, they're going to rebuild a new world, it's a resetting, <laughs> it's a, it's like, you know, the, the whole great reset thing or whatever, and then you've got this whole transhuman thing going on here, because a bit like in the Matrix, how they kind of bottle up these, these entities to gain their life energy. To feed the aliens, but in this sense, it's instead to was well, part of knowledge because obviously it's balanced on these books, books of knowledge, books of information, just like humans, you know, through the new perception of how these people see the world through an atheistic lens. Humans are just bottles of knowledge, bottles of data, you know, data. That's all they are, you know, even from the perspective of a from a kind of atheistic scientist who just wants to create, you know, nanotechnology, corporations and all of this, you know, humans are data, they can be reduced, you know, kind of like in the, you know, they follow the same perspective as um, Agent Smith, I think his name is, in the Matrix films, you know, humans are just data, they're not really anything else, they're not anything spiritual, there's nothing etheric, etheric or you know, transcendental about humans or human nature or the passions of humanity, you know, so it's kind of got this very eerie, it's so eerie, this is such, this as a piece of art, it, it, in relation to what's going on now, I just see it as very powerful, I have this eerie, dark sense of destruction and renewal, fire itself, just as Prometheus was in the, in, the, in the beginning, taking fire down, as I was saying just a minute ago, you know, fire can destroy and recreate. And this is kind of the, the painting, the symbolic illustration of what that means, the destruction and the creation of a new world. And then we've got another really weird one. Now, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Literally, okay, we've got Jesus Christ here, 
and he is what, what could you call this? Rescued himself from the crucifix. Now, I think this is like a postmodern, postmodern illustration of spiritualism. The new world. What what will the spiritual world in the future look like? And this is kind of an image I I I. I I intuitively feel this is kind of the image I see with those because yeah, it's like a postmodern Jesus, whatever that would look like, is this. This is a postmodern Jesus. In the background you've got the military, industrial complex, materials, weapons, and then on the other right hand side you've got like a tank and I think skeletons and bits and bobs like that, and then obviously you've got the crucifix in which he's chopped down for himself. Which is interesting. And then you've got a Greek pillar and a Buddhist statue, a statue of Buddha. What does this mean? <laughs> well, it can mean whatever you want, but in relation to kind of maybe the future of spirituality, it's kind of like a postmodern depiction of a spiritual future. And it has this kind of Soviet tinge to it, as if, as if he is you know, triumphant in in rescuing himself or or he is triumphant for the future that he is save saving or something like this. And he's he's also got like a he's like multicoloured. He's got again another kind of robotic transhumanistic element to him. He's got these kind of metallic looking legs with a yellowish body. quite interesting it's quite liberating as well it's like um you know this could be the depiction of the ubermensch of what is required for there to be this kind of nietzschean movement of the ubermensch in the sense that you know we need to collectivize all forms of spirituality and create a kind of synchronistic or a form of syncretism to forward the future of man to create the ubermensch or to create the the next man in a sense the the over man and in the sense this kind of jesus image you know, it could kind of be blasphemous i guess i guess it is blasphemous <laughs> if you want to take it from a strictly religious traditional perspective it is very blasphemous in a way but He's kind of being triumphant in that he's overcoming or he's that he is moving himself forward for the future of man. You know, he's and maybe the broken cross itself kind of illustrates this kind of destruction of institution, this destruction of ideology, the breakdown of um the, the breakdown of constitution in the sense of what ideology is. That ideology is like a... is a fabrication of what things are or should be and that the amalgamation of all these things is to, in some way, try and produce something greater. But maybe it could also be something else. It could be kind of like that man of the future is actually doing the complete opposite thing. He's, he's destroying everything. And he's doing it with a kind of... with a kind of... Uh, arrogant... with a kind of arrogance. You know, in the sense that a... you know, a reductionist, atheistic, atomistic scientist would do it. That, you know, they're gonna shut down all of these things, they're going to disregard them with arrogance of scientific intelligence and all of this without the use of any wisdom. You know, they're going to say, ah, Buddhism, crap. Greek pillars, crap. And all of this other stuff, and let's put it all and cram it into this big thing in which, you can, in which we're going to burn, and let's chop down the cross, and let's do all of this. You, you kind of get all these images, and which is so good about this piece of art, because it doesn't really answer anything. But it kind of displays the kind of dialectic in which 
humanity would go spirituality wise in the transhuman age it's like well we're gonna throw away all of anything of the past in terms of spirit in terms of religion and we're gonna just burn it all <laughs> we're just gonna do away with it all, or at least in a sense commercialize it which would be a form of burning and then just shove it in the metaverse and just do away with the whole thing and not really find a fundamental answer in any of it at all or maybe it could be the other way around it could be no we're gonna make a synchronistic or a form of syncretism through the amalgamation of all of these things because the truth lives in everything to some degree as i think it says in the bible the the truth uh, exists in everything or well, the word of god at least re is represented in everything that exists to some extent which would be the same message from a, uh, someone who does syncretism is that you can find or perennialism is that, that you can find the truth in everything there's an element of truth in every single thing that has existed and will exist you know whether it be i don't know morally ethically um in terms of principles and all of this so yeah there's a it's very interesting pieces and they and they kind of to me at least they kind of raise a kind of prophetic at least all of these all of these pieces of art, these frescoes from this guy, they illustrate a kind of prophetic image of the future. A very imaginative depiction of different things in which could be illustrated of what the future will look like, symbolically. And of course it also illustrates the Promethean beginning of how this change has occurred, and the, the spiritual possibilities or the moralizations in which we made it towards spiritualism and and the, the hierarchical structure of what these things will look like any of this type of stuff this is what i see in all of this art that fascinates me i think it's really interesting but yeah that's what i fundamentally see in these pieces of art that i thought i would share with you today because i just find it interesting I find it very interesting and you know not a lot of people talk about art in a kind of philosophical way well they do that's what art kind of theory is sometimes when people try to analyze the meaning of art and all of this but in in relation to kind of a new dawn of age a new dawn of era i thought it'd be interesting to apply kind of like a psychological look to how these things kind of illustrate themselves to me um how society will change in a way you know there's a lot of interesting kind of prophetic imagery that you know based in science fiction that you see being or, or, or see you can see was done like in the 80s that is very interesting as well and i try to probably put a couple of links in the description below to that but it also kind of shows you know even in sense of science fiction i was talking about this in the patreon video is the power of belief um in relation to all these things going on and the power of science fiction on that behalf as well because science fiction is itself a form of belief of what the future will become and how belief itself is magic you know it is magic that's what magic is in a sense um <clears throat> you know if you i think that that demonstrates at least to a lot of people you know the power of belief the power of faith especially in a progressive sense not really in a conservative sense but in a progressive sense the power of belief definitely pulls the world forward into a particular reality of how things are to be and you can like apply this to conspiracy theory as well so like, the more you believe in something the more likely it's going to happen because thoughts become things but also in a progressive way that thoughts become things because people just believe them that these things are going to happen 
which you could kind of say is like conspiracy theorists are, you know, I said this and people got really annoyed at me, which is funny, because <laughs> it's always good to, you know, even in thought, be the, the kind of chaos magician of, of kind of fabricated ideologies that people have inside their minds, but that, you know, it's kind of like institutional Christianity in the sense that, as Nietzsche said, I think, a long time ago, that, uh, <laughs> that they kind of created their own demise through their belief. And they didn't, you know, in the sense that you go to the Colosseum and all the Christians are sitting there praying and the lions are just going to eat them. Because the Roman Empire just wants to prove that, you know, their belief won't save them in a sense, in the material sense. And what I mean by that is in the sense that all conspiracy theorists would, with their theory, which isn't action-based, is not action-based, will, you know, will theorize their future. And they'll theorize their future to fail and be a demise, in the sense that they will say what will happen to them and how they are overpowered by beings which, or by people who want to be their own masters in the world. So that, there's an element of slave morality within the conspiracy theory, which is, you know, often the sense why conspiracy theorists don't offer any solutions, or they, they just offer loads of problems without a solution. You know, they talk about the problems of this, the problems of that, how each conspiracy theory is a problem, but there's no, there's never any solution. And it's kind of like tarot. And there's a magician. The magician is the conspirator or the conspirator. Um, <laughs> conspirator. The conspirator. Uh, who's the magician. And you could kind of say that the conspiracy theorist is just the Maybe the hanging man, maybe. Because there's this weight on their shoulders to actually maybe do something, but they never do it. Which is an interesting thought to have a think about. But yeah, that's what uh, that's all I want to say today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it interesting. And that you yourself look into this guy's artwork and the different forms of frescoes he did. Uh, during Mexico or in Mexico and around the world in the 1920s to I think 1940s So I'll put a link in the description of that artist and his other work in the description But it's over that if you enjoyed this video make sure to give it a like comment your thoughts down below and subscribe and uh, I'll speak to you guys in the next video. Cheers